Normally when I receive requests for interviews, it's for print, radio, TV or crypto-based podcasts. This one was a little left of field. Trade Tools, who have around 20 local stores supplying trade tools, have their own podcast called Tradio, featuring people in the industry, suppliers, tips and advice and people of interest. But ironically, their head office and studio was at Ormo, the location where I was chased by the bad Yowie in 97 which was the catalyst for Australian Yowie research, yowiehunters.com. So, I had a story to tell. Perhaps more than just one. Enjoy. Alright, so here we are guys, another episode of uh, your favourite podcast radio And today we have a special guest, Dean Harrison Just uh, give us a bit of an intro into yourself mate I'm Dean Harrison, I'm the founder of Australian Yowie Research Also known as the Yowie Hunters in the media Uh, It all started for me back in the 90s when I was thrown in the deep end I wasn't looking for them, they found me uh, as a result of a life-changing encounter, thirst for knowledge and lack of information, I started the Yowie Research Organisation, or yowiehunters.com, that you'll find on the internet. Uh, we were the first in the world to have a website dedicated to the research of the Yowie, and uh, it's sort of been leaps and bounds from then. It's taken us on a, an amazing adventure, not just domestically, but also internationally, different places of the world. And uh, we have a database of over 1,000 reports dating back to the first fleet, the first settlers. And a lot of our database and uh, archives are protected by the National Australian Library. And uh, our work has also been uh, the basis of books uh, for, for many years, also been involved in documentaries and television, radio, etc., uh, spanning over three decades. And uh, so that's, that's sort of how it all began. All right, before we get right into it, I'd just like to say that I'm coming into this conversation as a sceptic, which I'm sure you're used to, but, you know, not that I'm trying to disprove it or anything. I just haven't experienced anything, you know, to to make me think otherwise yet. But uh, open-minded, sceptical, but open-minded, mate. That's uh, where I stand. Yeah, my role isn't so much to try and convince anyone. My role is to simply present the facts. Yes, yeah, cool. And uh, all the facts are on the the facts and the research is, is on the website. And again, we have uh, a database st- uh, stretching back for 250 years, back to yep. the First Fleet. And when the First Fleet first arrived here, they're told by the Aboriginals of the time about the hairy man of the bush. Yep. And being sceptical, uh, and also unknowing what was really out there in our terrain, uh, the white people refused to believe them. And yep. It wasn't too long while we are building uh, our new ports in, uh, say, Brisbane, uh, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, and we're putting uh, roads and townships into virgin forest. We were bumping into these creatures ourselves, and it was documented back in the time. Yeah. So though, we have to remember that during those times, there was no communication. There was no internet. There was no phone lines. There was no faxes. Basically, it was a letter delivered by a horse, and it took a long time to get from one place to other. So therefore, there was no collaboration with all these different people who didn't know each other, mind you, Yeah. in all these different ports in different states as we were founding the country. And uh, the descriptions that were coming in and being reported in the newspapers of the time were were all pretty much the same description of what we're seeing now, which generally speaking is is a hominid, not a hominin. We are hominins. Uh, The great apes, etc., are hominids. There is a difference. Uh, It was something sort of between a hominin and a hominid that was being reported, covered in hair. It was roughly about six or seven feet tall or taller. Some are over eight feet tall. Uh, Extremely muscular and they had deep set eyes, very Neanderthal, caveman type look. The head sitting on the shoulders, the appearance of no neck, uh, longer arms than us, disproportionately long arms and perhaps a little bit shorter legs. And uh, so these creatures were being sp- spied on, saw all the time. And during the 1800s, the sightings were so prevalent around the country and being reported so often that the naturalists of the time were debating whether Australia had its own primate, indigenous primate. So do you think the sightings nowadays that, oh, you know, obviously they've 
uh, slow down or they're a lot more prevalent back then. Do you think that is due to like a drop in Yowie population or just them avoiding civilization sort of thing? There's more reports now than ever before. And but back in the old days, back in the, the days prior to communication, there was no one to tell. And a yep. lot of these, these townships and, and farms, et cetera, they're very remote. It took a long time to get from one place to another. And, you know, there's always that degree of scepticism. And a lot of people, they either didn't tell anybody or if they did tell somebody, it would be close family or friends. And that's yep. Yep. pretty much where it lay. It went no f- further and it was never recorded, not like what we're doing today. So these stories over the generations and generations and families, et cetera, they're all lost in time. Yep. So so imagine the, how many reports what were actually happening back then and how many didn't go reported was it one to ten one was reported ten lost uh, yep. was it one to a hundred one to a thousand and if we've got a thousand reports right now imagine how many real reports are out there that, that haven't been documented yeah yeah it's interesting uh especially back in the day you know when we were settling that uh different ports from different places in the country had reports of the same thing you know without communication between those ports a lot of people would probably write it off as just a big ape or something as well as weird as that might yeah. be do you think that well, happens a lot or well it did i mean back back in the 1800s like i was saying that they really believed that australia had its own indigenous primate yeah. and they were saying the headlines were in the the, the sydney herald and so forth uh the gorilla sighted again. The sightings b- between um, Sydney and Canberra, they were probably the most prevalent of their time of the day. Uh, but, you know, I think coming into the 19th century or the 1900s, I should say, uh, there's a lot of fear of ridicule going on. So a lot of people were very apprehensive about coming forward. And again, sure. this is pre-internet where everything sort of gets a little bit more liberal these days and people can speak their views. And since we've been doing this, since the mid-90s, which is the embryonic stages of the internet, uh, I think we've opened up a pathway and social acceptance for people to come forward because you can go on our website and hear people tell their own stories from their mouths and and telling the story that that comes from the heart. And we have a lot of people come to us now and say, well, you know, I heard that story that this person told and I think it's time for me to tell mine. Yeah, that is a real good thing, I suppose. Well, giving uh, people that comfort to get something off their chest that maybe they've been harbouring for, you know, a long time. Yeah, and, and a classic example of this was a, a gentleman by the name of Clyde Shepherdson. He was living in Nanango, which is uh, just west of the Sunshine Coast. He had an encounter with three of his friends while hunting <laughs> in 1932. Now, in about the year 2000 or so forth, uh, he came to us, he reached out to us because uh, we were doing a lot of media at the time, and he said to me, I want to get this off my chest before I die. Yeah. Nobody in his lifetime, other than the people who were there at the event during the encounter, nobody knew about it other than his wife. And he said, now it's time for me to tell my story. He told his story, and a few weeks later he passed away. But at least we, ha- we have that story now. It's just so important for people to come forward. How many accounts have you had on like thousands, hundreds? I guess if you've been doing it since the mid-90s, you'd have... Well, what we have on the database is basically the ones that are, are first-hand sightings. Uh, now, they have many, many more that come to us with an encounter. There's a difference between just an encounter and a sighting. A sighting is something you see with your own eyes. Uh, an encounter might be something that's happening to you out there in the bush at night time. You can't see it, but all these things are happening to you and you're being chased out of the bush by, you know, one of these creatures, but not getting your eyes on it. So with the with the sightings, we have, we have over a thousand on there uh, of really, really, really good reports. I have heard, um, I heard someone mention uh, the Carbrook Yowie. Yeah, no, not Carbrook. Where is it? Springbrook. Springbrook, Springbrook yeah. Yes. One of our followers. Who was <laughs> it's it? It's a world apart, Carbrook and Springbrook, yeah. Josh on Instagram was asking, yeah. what's your take on the Springbrook Yowie? Yeah, well, Josh, uh, it just so happens that I'm, I've got an expedition to Springbrook tomorrow night. <laughs> and uh, uh, I've got a lot of experience with Springbrook. We were called up to Springbrook the first time would have been about 1998. And uh, we went to this property, the Maguire's property. They're very well known up there at Springbrook. And we, we'd spent years on this property. 
uh, at the end. But yeah, we had a very, well, I wouldn't say friendly Yeah, It was a female, which I, I believe is a female. Uh, look, Springbrook's had sightings there since probably about the early to mid 70s that we're aware of, probably you know, countless more that ha- weren't reported. The most famous uh, encounter or most famous famous sighting was Bill O'Chee, former Senator Bill O'Chee, and he was with the uh, the Southport School at the time. They were on a camp, and this happened uh, in 1977. And there was over 20 of them that witnessed this creature at the back of the camp at the same time. And it was moving in like a, a, a crab-like fashion. It was ripping the foliage out of the ground. And uh, even the, the high school uh, teachers were there witnessing this. And this made the papers, the Gold Coast Bulletin at the time, and and, uh, and went went right around the country. And of course, you now when he was in office, I think the, uh, the opposition brought that up and uh, didn't work in his favour very well. Yeah, yeah. So let's go back to the start in, in your early days of uh, what, when you started. What are your most memorable encounters? Well, 1995 was probably my first introduction. Like I said, you know, I didn't go looking for them, they found me. Yeah. So I got dragged into it and dived in the deep end. Now, in 1995, I was living at Eagle Heights, top of Mount Tambourine. I came home at about 11 o'clock at night, a sloping block that went on to rainforest. And uh, there was this god all modding racket coming from the rainforest, which is just uh, beyond the chicken wire fence at the end of the yard. And this is pitch black, of course. And as I'm walking down towards the front door and listening to this, and this is a noise that put your hair on end. You had goosebumps. You know, it, this noise just went through you. It was horrible. I mean, it was a really, really horrible noise. The, of likes of which, you know, of course, I've never, never heard before. But it wasn't just the noise that was foreign. It was the fact that this thing, whatever it was, was on two legs. It was bipedal. Mm-hmm. It was walking on two legs. You could hear it walking in the swamp. Crunch, crunch, crunch crunch. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now your mind's going through all the Australian native animals that you know of and which ones are bipedal that can make that noise. Danang, error 404, file not found. And so then it starts to rip out the foliage out of the ground. You can hear the roots come out of the ground and then it throws the foliage through the bush the foliage hits other trees. You can hear it impacting with the other trees and then falls to the ground. At the same time, it's making this girl, horrible noise. I mean, he's in a filthy mood and he's stomping. And it's okay, here's number three. Okay, he's uh, the, the vocal capacity. Nah, nah. It's on. It's bipedal. It's on two legs. No, it's still going through my native Australian animal list. And now it has the capacity to pull foliage out. Not only pull it out of the ground, but throw it. So therefore, it has hands. Then our yeah strike three. All right. So I had two options at this time. I could grab the dolphin torch, which is behind the front door, and go down and have a look. And the little <laughs> devil on my right shoulder is going, "Yeah, you know what? Let's go down and have a look." <laughs> and then the guy on my left shoulder is going. Uh, don't listen to him. No, 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 no. Bad <laughs> idea. So I end up not going down there. There's, there's something inside me that says, you do not want to know. So I went inside, I locked the door, and that was that. Now, there's a few other instances that happened after then, but it wasn't long after then that we moved to Ormo. Now, Ormo, turns out, ended up being the Gold Coast's probably premium area for Yowie sightings. So this was the kicker. This was the key. This is what got everything started. This is what got AYR started, was this night. It was June 1997. I was trying to lose some weight. I was jogging at night, late at night, around about 11.30, and there's a stretch of bushland between Ormo and Norfolk. And the property at that time, during that period, it was all new real estate. So we were we'd encroached on this bush line, bushland corridor and we built right in on it. Now, at the time, when you ran or jogged down this track between Norfolk and uh, Ormo, you'd reach your hands out both sides of the track and you could touch the trees. That's how narrow it was. And in there, there was the creeks and those swamps and it was, it was a messy sort of area, high voltage power lines. And so the area that I went to run into, it had, the, it had a mown uh, grass, it came off um, Vaughan Drive and um, the trees started probably about 50, 60 metres in and uh, they sort of went round to, to the right and up towards the main road of um, Vaughan Drive. So... At this, this point, as I was just about to run into 
this bush corridor. It was a very, very dark night. I stopped and I thought I'd make a quick phone call. And so I walked along the, the, the ridge of the trees and I stood behind some trees and I made this phone call. And I'm on the phone and about 10 minutes in, the person on the other end says, what is all that noise? Now I know yeah, this sounds bizarre because how did she hear it and I couldn't? So I've tuned out of the conversation and into what was going on behind me. And sure enough, those trees coming down, those, uh, those branches being felled, there was a lot of noise going on. The first thing that came to my mind was as a group of kids that had snuck out at night, like we would, but this was a Tuesday night. We never, yeah. we, we never did it on school nights. So I was sort of half listening to the conversation, half listening to what was going on out there. And then all the noise in the bush subsided. It was gone. And you know, back into the conversation. And then I heard a crack and it was a little bit closer this time. It was a very loud crack. And uh, I started listening a bit more. There's another crack a bit closer and another a bit closer. And every time this crack happened, it would stop there'd be no noise and then you'd hear the foliage slowly starting to part and then something slithering through you just hear that leaf noise across the body very very slowly and then be a twig would snap and then oh, stop stop now i was aware that somebody was sneaking up on me so i said i'll have someone sneak up on me etc etc and i was boxing at the time and i was fit and i wasn't concerned about anybody and uh, I, my comment was, no, I'll just let this person come as close as they want and I'll see what's on his mind. And so with my back to the bush, now totally absorbed with what was going on behind me, uh, this person, which I thought at the time, came right up to the bush line, which was about 10 metres behind me. And suddenly I got these chills, these chills of something. It was an experience that I've never, ever had in my life. These chills ran from my feet to my head and back down again. And my body was locked solid. I had no rhyme or reason. I've never experienced anything like this. I was like a rabbit in spotlights. I knew something was wrong. It's like a sixth sense just kicked in and all your alarm bells just went off. And I couldn't move. I was just, I, and I was too scared to turn around and I knew it was all because of whatever was behind me. And, um, and I knew I had to get out of there. I knew I was in danger, but I didn't know why. So I've, I've sort of half turned a shoulder the best I could. I've turned my neck a little bit and my eyes the best I could. And I could see this massive silhouette standing there in the darkness. It would have been seven feet tall, it was wide, and it was not a human. And I, I, hairs were on end, I had goosebumps, I was locked solid and I just didn't know what to do but I knew that I had to get out of there because I was in danger and I was also very aware that do not make eye contact with this thing because it'll get worse. And so I literally counted in my head one, two, three. I forced my shoulder, which forced my hip, which forced my knee, which forced my foot to leave the ground and the moment my foot went forward, came out from behind me. It was huge. It was a diaphragm that was like a bear and a lion rolled into one. Uh, it was well beyond any human vocal capacity. It was enormous. All the dogs and all the acreages were all going crazy. And the moment I started running, this thing took off after me, except he didn't take a straight line because I was out in the middle, well, not the middle of a field, but I was in an open area. Now he's taken the, the tree line to my left, which uh, sort of goes out a little bit and then it comes up towards the road. I'm running as fast as fast as I can on this mown grass. He is smashing through the trees like they're toothpicks and on every footstep, every footstep, his diaphragm would bounce like it'd be a rah, rah, rah. over the top of this diaphragm bouncing. He'd be roaring at me and yelling at me and he'd be smashing things down. And he was so fast. He was would have run about four times my speed through terrain that I would have tripped over in the dark. And before I knew it, he's running right beside me on my left hand side. And I knew there was no escaping this thing. It was right there and then that my life flashed in front of my eyes, I thought, "This is it. I'm dead. This is this is this. Is, uh, there is no escape. There was nothing I could possibly do to defend myself about something that was so big, so strong, so fast, so powerful, just so aggressive." And I, w I basically just said, "Goodbye. This is it." And then he starts to run ahead of me, and I'm going, "What? What? What? What?" And 
I don't know, I've realized what he's doing. He's getting ahead of me to try and cut me off. And I go, whoa. So I've turned to my, to my right and I started going right and he's lunged out of the bushes. But good thing for me, these things don't like open spaces. They like to keep themselves concealed. So he stopped there and I'm racing towards the streetlight, looking over my shoulder. He's turned about and he's walked back to the edge of the, the bush there. He's turned around and he's squatted, just squatting there in the foliage, looking at me. Shit, eh? So, because that, that would feel like a bear or something bearing down on you, wouldn't it? Like, it. Are they actually aggressive? Are they known to be dangerous? Yeah. Well, I got hit by one in, uh, in 2009, but we can get onto that later. <laughs> Shit. I was, I was so invested in that story then. I forgot we were even here <laughs> so, doing so, the so podcast. Uh, after you have an experience like that, you cannot let it go. No, of course. You, know, you want answers. Yeah, of course. And- For me, there was no answers. This is the embryonic stages of the internet. There was nothing online. So So what did you assume it was when this- I knew exactly what it was. Yeah, right. Okay. What about the first time when when you were- uh, when you heard it in the bush, did because were you familiar with Yowie then, or there'd always been a lot of talk on the Gold Coast yep. about the Yowie. The, yep. I mean, it's had its history and it always popped up in the in the newspapers. Yeah, and uh, there was a show in 1994 at a place called Cranbark in New South Wales, and a girl by the name of Julie Clark who had uh, very well-documented um, encounter with the Yowie while she was horse riding. And that sort of resonated with me. So I knew it from that and also just talking to locals who just bring it up in normal conversation back in the day and, and the local newspaper reports. And, uh, you know, I mean, there was no other native Australian animal that could have done this because it could yeah, have performed it. And it certainly was not a human. Can I just yeah. confirm? So Bigfoot, Sasquatch, Yowie, all the that, same thing? I was just going to ask the same thing. Is it thing, just what we, different countries call them? Yeah, we to assume that they sort of come from a from a the same sort of evolutionary tree. yeah yeah most most continents have their own versions of the same thing um now the ancestors of the aboriginals were said to have come from africa about seventy eight thousand years ago yeah so they came down through indonesia and over the wallace line the wallace line disappeared that was the, the wallace line is um basically the, the, the Torres Strait, which is now, that was all land. That's what we call the, the Wallace Line. Now it's just the Torres Strait Islands because it was all flooded. But before that time, that's how the Aboriginals got here. And that's how these things obviously got here. Now in the Aboriginal DNA, the, a lot of it's Denisovan, which is us, but there's also a percentage of an unknown hominid that we have still not worked out. The, the Aboriginal skull, began gracile like ours, yeah. but it bred with this unknown hominid yeah. and that caused it to go uh, robustus. Um, so, and, and, and back back in the day, uh, the Neanderthals, basically it was a big melting pot of inbreeding, all, all these different um, uh, species, the, the Neanderthals and, and uh, the Denisovans and, and so forth, then they're, they're all interbreeding and they say, I mean, science paleontology say today, it was more than likely that the women were taken at force, the opposite tribes. And this is how we all became to be, how we are, and the, and the different cultures and different races we have today. Yeah, of course. So they're all technically the same, just different yeah, well, basically the same g- genus, but different species over over time. Yeah, okay. like us humans, are eh? you know, look, we differ from other countries, but we're all essentially the same thing. Yeah, and does Australia have more of them, or are they about in comparison to other country sightings? Well, the thing with Australia is we have less population. Yeah, yeah. So for sure. I mean, we're pr- pretty much the same size as America. They have what three hundred thirty million people, yeah, as opposed to our thirty. Good destination down here, you think? Cause and a lot of our no country is, is never been never been walked over, never been yeah. traversed, never been discovered. Particularly up north. I mean, it's very unrepresented in in sightings. But that's because I mean, I was up there only last week, and uh, there's not a lot of us around up that top end. Yeah, for sure. Elusive and hard to find. What what's the that's the secret to their survival. I think it's ingrained with them uh, as as children as from birth. Uh, beware about uh, beware of the dangers of humans, and that again, like just, that's the secret of their survival is not being seen. But the problem is, they make some pretty silly mistakes, some pretty ordinary mistakes. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting that you know would they uh, make mistakes due to like things like your encounter, emotionally just get carried away all of a sudden and then realise, oh, yeah, get yeah. Back. I mean, look that. that they're biological, so they're no different to us, no different to any other animals. Animals kill animals, humans kill animals, animals kill humans. Yep. 
they're no angels. So they're having a bad day. They can turn predatory you know, yeah. as, as well and as often as, as we can. For sure. And yeah. I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that these things are responsible for a lot of missing people, yep. of which I was nearly one. Yeah, wow. So wh- when you go out looking for one, you know, or looking for, for Yowies, what is your goal? Like, do you want to just uh, watch them and, and, and document you know, behaviourism, or do you want to actually try and try and catch one? Or well, there's no chance of catching one. That's that's unrealistic. I mean, the best you can hope for is try to get some sort of footage, and there will be footage at some stage, especially with the introduction of death de- uh, de- <laughs> <laughs> death cam, <laughs> dash cams. Well, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Um, <laughs> you were the death cam, <laughs> and um, yeah. Mm. So you know, with, with them in play, I mean, so many of the sightings these days, I mean, they are roadside and particularly at night time and some of them you have to, you can't help but think it has to be deliberate. They know the car's coming. They can see the lights just as well as we can. Um, sometimes you think, was it deliberately trying to put that car off the road? You know? Yeah, right. So there, so it's uh, fairly common knowledge that they, they're quite intelligent. Is that... Yeah, yeah, a, yeah right, absolutely. Cool. Masters of their own domain. Yeah, yep. just so so powerful, so so muscular, so powerful, uh, so fast as well. Extremely pa- fast, and they can navigate terrain that we can't. But the other thing is the really scary part about these. When and you know this while you're around them, is their eyesight, their night vision. Right, they, their, their eyes are sunken right in their head, uh, right deep in their heads, and they have the very pronounced eye ridges. Yeah, and the reason for this is is p- to protect their eyes, so they're sunken in. They're sort of like up blinds over their eyes, but they can see at night time like we can during the day. So they can run through things that we'd be tripping over. Uh, I've got a lot of experience with that firsthand. Um, but getting back onto how they often make mistakes, and I don't know whether you recall or not, but in Witherin, which is next to Canungra, uh, January last year, we had a case that made uh, national headlines, in fact, it made world headlines that we investigated. Now, this is a classic case of mistake. This wasn't deliberate. It was with a truck driver. He was making his morning delivery and he was coming back down through the range back towards Canungra. Now, it wasn't his truck that morning. His truck was in for a service and this truck didn't have a dash cam, but his did. Right. Now, time, place and circumstance, perhaps if he did have his own truck, you know, timing would be different and this wouldn't have happened. So yep. who knows? But he's coming down through the range. He slipped it into neutral, so he's not making any noise. The roads were a little bit wet. It was about 10 o'clock in the morning. And as he comes around this steep, uh, tight right hand bend there's a, there's a steep embankment to the right hand side and as he's coming around this thing had just leapt off that embankment just his last his, his left foot had just just broken the surface and he's mid flight coming down onto the road and He's hit the brakes as this thing lands. He says, when it landed, he said it landed like Superman, two feet and a fist on the ground. And he's locked the truck up and he's sliding towards it. And this thing, he says, he stands up, is looking at him. He said it had three expressions. And he said, he said, okay, first of all, it looked in the face like a primate, like a monkey, right. a 10 foot monkey, mind you, a nine foot monkey. <laughs> um, he said, but the expressions were human. He said, the first expression was shock. The second expression, embarrassment. Third expression, anger. And it walked up to the, the front of the truck, which was only two metres away, and he said he hit the front of this truck so hard, he said it was like hitting a small Mazda 3. He said it went right through the truck. And this is a guy that's in it. This isn't a little truck. This is a big truck. This yeah. is like a big semi sort of rig. Yeah. And he said it was so tall, he had to lean down and look up through the windscreen to see the top of its head. And he said right. it was pretty, pretty angry. But he said, he said, he, he said, I don't like using this this term. He said, but beautiful. He said, you should have seen the form of this thing, the muscularity. Yeah, yeah. He said, you could just see through the hair. And he said, the hair wasn't messy. He was well groomed. And he was just he was just a real good looking specimen of whatever he was. And he turned around. And this is right next to the military base, of course. So he's, and this thing turns around, jumps over a fence and it goes. And that's one of these flukes. But there's times and circumstances, situations where it has got to be deliberate, particularly at night time. Yeah, for sure. That's on video, is it? Yeah, we have that that uh, that report speaking with that witness, yeah. Okay. Oh, so when you go out, of a, how often do you go out 
Uh, have a night time trying to, uh, you know, encounter or document. Not as often as what we used to. At yeah. the moment, our priority is really just doing the documenting, and that is taking up so much time. Yeah, and, yeah. And there's a team of us, and we all work on it really hard, and we all put in a lot of hours every day, and it just doesn't stop. I yeah, mean, that's how sure. busy we are because the reports just keep coming in. But, yeah, we do go out, and we're – at the moment here on the Gold Coast, I mean, look, we've got people all over the country that are going out all the time. Yeah, so yeah. I can only speak to, about myself and, and what I'm doing. We're, we're currently going out probably about you know, one, once a week or once a fortnight oh, to okay, two, right. two different areas. And one of, one of the most interesting cases that we've had in the last couple of months was one up at a place called Bellbird Grove, which is just north of Brisbane. Yeah. And, uh, and this guy was an academic – you know, he's, he's nobody's fool. His yeah, wife, yeah. wife's an academic. He's actually an athlete like, from the top level as well, so we can't say who he is. Yeah. But he'd been going to this area for uh, probably about 20-odd years, never seen anything strange. This is what a lot of our witnesses say to us. You know, I've been driving these roads or I've been living on this farm for so many years, never said anything strange until. Yeah. It's always that one day. So he was in this situation where his one day – came along and he was, he's walking along the track and he hears this rock clacking. Now, this whole park has been closed down due to COVID. Right, yeah, and, true. And so no one was allowed in there. He knew the back way in there because he'd been going there since he was a kid. Uh, so he's walking down, he's hearing this rock clacking. He goes, what the heck is that? And it's really, really loud. It's echoing all up and down the creeks. And he was pretty invested into where he was. Like he was way off the tracks because he likes to go through, he takes photos of fauna and flora and so forth. And um, so he's gone to investigate and he's gone down into the creek bed and he starts to walk up the creek and he looks over this log and here is this juvenile yowie, yeah. primate looking creature. When I say juvenile, it was more in the, of its actions. Now he did the actions for us, which you can watch on, on online. Right. And here is this, this thing and he's dancing about in the creek, doing all these primate sort of actions and turns and swivels and clacking the, the, the rocks and, and, and all this sort of thing. And it turns around and it sees him up the creek. And he said he got this expression in his face and he turns around and he looks up the bank to an area that our witness can't see and he starts doing these like kissy noises, like chirpy, yeah. chirpy noises with an expression on his face. The moment he did that, boom, crash, out comes Big Daddy into the creek and looks at him and then does this incredible Hulk sort of yell and, yeah. and, and stance. And he said, he said, he said I had two cameras on me at the time. Yeah. He said, do you think I thought about that? He said, if it was flight or fight, fight or flight, he said, I was out there. He said, it's what I call life preservation. Yeah, He said, sure. I, I, no, I wasn't sticking around for I, I, And he said, I did a personal best that day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I bet I would too. But, but he's one of these people who struggled with it afterwards. We have so many people that struggle. Um, it has such a profound effect on people afterwards. And they, they come to us to seek counsel. They, people see counsel. So some people actually have to go on medication, but a lot of people never get over it. Yeah, actually, scepticism going over there. <laughs> no, it's cool. I'm, I'm, it, I ask you how often you go out because I'd love to come and tag along one time if you, <laughs> if you accept tag alongs. Yeah, we've, we've got a good one coming up soon. I won't say exactly where it is, but we'll just say it's in the Springbrook, air, Springbrook area. It's a place, it's a location I wanted to go for probably the last 20 odd years, but the council have opened it up recently so we can get access to this secret area, which I, I've got a pretty good idea. This is where they're coming from. I would be ecstatic to tag along. I would make my blood a year. So how many sightings have you personally had? Was it three? Oh, no, I've, I've had a lot more than that because, you know, just keep in mind that we've been called out all over the country for, you know, decades now. So we find ourselves in situations uh, on properties where it's been active for a long time. So we put ourselves in those positions where we're in for a pretty good chance of an encounter. Uh, we also have our, our favourite places that we go where we have repetitive uh, – rep <laughs> Try that word. <laughs> <laughs> where we have many yeah, uh, yeah. encounters. Now, shortly after the Ormo – I moved to Sydney, and this is where I had one of the most fascinating encounters uh, of – now, this is probably the only good one that I've come across. In most of my experience, I've been on the business end, on the pointy end yeah. of these creatures. They haven't quite liked me, but this one was different. This one was like a big kid. And I think the reason for this is because he was so used to having human interaction with this community of Hazelbrook in the, in 
the Blue Mountains. And he would go from uh, from backyard to backyard and steal clothes off people's clotheslines. He was like a kleptomaniac, this thing. And um, – and so many of the locals knew of him like for, for, for years and years. And so I got a call out to this location and I ended up tracking him back to where he's coming from. Um, and some, some of the, the locals that were living there, they would say that at night time, he'd come so close to the house and so close to, say, the lounge room window. I think one guy said to me, I don't know whether he was watching us or he's watching the television. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, they ended up uh, cutting the trees back, uh, right back. And there's another woman who lived next door and she was doing her dishes uh, one day and she sees a little bit, f- bit of fluff on the other side of the windowsill as she's doing the dishes and she's sort of focusing on it and doing the dishes at the same time. And this fluff started to get a little bit higher and a little bit higher and then it turned into her head and then it stood right up above the window. So she's ah, dropped the dishes and ran off into the lounge room. So anyway, I ended up tracking him back to the other valley and this thing was like clockwork. And, and this well, we'd named him Fatfoot. And uh, <laughs> Fatfoot. He, uh, he used to come up on the same track, same time, every night. And now yeah, this is like all pre technology really well, we, yeah, we didn't, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, my inventory consisted of like a little box brownie camera with a, a range of about a three meter flash I mean that's about all I had back in those days and uh, I used to cry out to everybody anyone that, uh, like production companies uh, anyone who had some some form of equipment but no one was listening back then uh, remember this is like you no know, 1997 and um so he used to come up and he used to want to play games all the time. And he used to want to play this game called the stupid human. And I was a stupid human. And he'd play this game trying to, his, 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 his role in all this was to see how close he could get to me without me knowing. So I would pretend that I didn't know he was there because he was just that dumb. And, and he'd get up so close to me. He'd go from tree to tree to tree. And then he'd start to get inside your comfort zone and go, alarm bell, start going off. I mean, you know, how far do you trust him? And what's his next move if he sort of gets a little bit too close? So then you'd have to put, put the spotlight on and, and off he'd run back down into the valley and he'd go along the bottom of the valley and then start again from a different direction and he played this game all night and we played so often uh and there's one time i had a couple of friends from queensland who came down because i wanted to show them what was going on and have them witness fat foot as well and we we had the, 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 this this guy called phil and i said phil he's going to either come up on this track it's, it's eight o'clock at night come up on this track or he's going to come up on this one that we're standing on. So you go over by that track there, go behind that, that log and get ready with your camera. And the first thing you're going to hear is a branch break down the bottom and then you know he's on his way. So he went over there and we're sitting there and we're waiting. It's only a few minutes, crack, crunch, crunch. Yep, he's on his way. Crack, crack. He's coming up on Phil's track. Crunch, crunch, crunch. And up he's coming. Everything's breaking, getting smashed. And then everything just goes silent. And... Myself and this other guy, Warren, we're looking over where Phil is going, what's going on over there? We're watching, we're watching. And then there's all this kerfuffle and commotion. We went running over there and Phil's standing there with the camera. He's as white as a sheet. Phil, Phil, what happened? And he said, well, you know how you, you asked me to stand behind this dump? Yeah. Well, I did. And... Um, and then he came up on the other side and then I stood up and he stood up at the same time. They're both looking at each other from either side of the stump. And he had the, he had the camera in his hand, finger on the button. Do you think he was going to take the, take the shot? <laughs> no, last thing on his mind. So later in the night, they said, where is he? I said, oh, he's still here somewhere. And with that, I picked up the spotlight and it was a random shot just out in the darkness. Bang, fair square, right in the chest I hit him. He's standing there out in the open, not hiding from us, in the open, not hiding behind a tree, in the open. And I hit him fair square in the chest. He got the biggest fright of his life and he turns to his right and he runs and he runs to a hide behind a tree. But this tree is too small and his shoulders are sticking out both sides. So no, that's not what, that's no good. So he turns around and he runs to the other tree, which is big enough and he goes down to all fours and he, and he, and he backs off and he goes back down uh, into the valley to start again. But the premise of this story is how aware they are of how blind we are at night time. Yeah, right. Yeah. So what what uh, does their diet consist of? Like is it uh, – do they – are they omnivorous? Yep, they're omnivores. A lot of people like to think that they are – uh, car, uh, carnivores, but no, they're not. They're omnivores. They're yeah. they're opportunists. So yeah, well, that's that's what I was thinking. If they're opportunistic 
sort of hunters, being out there is is uh, you know it, that's pretty bloody risky. If you know, I don't know. No, yeah. They'll eat every, anything. And, you know, they've been known to steal chickens from uh, people's coops, or even just the eggs, stealing them from. And so, and and being known to be able to open latches as well. I mean, they're, they're not that far removed from us. Opening a latch isn't isn't a yeah, and then also, I mean, people say now are they um, are they nocturnal or are they, are yeah. they diurnal, which means daytime, daytime diurnal, nocturnal, nighttime? No, they're cathmeral. There's a new word for you, cathmeral, which so means both. both. Right? Yeah. Okay. So they do sleep, obviously. Yeah, but that's on their terms. Yeah, and they, yeah. they probably sleep more during the day, um, mm-hmm. but because you know when and, and this is this is a, an interesting thing, and this is something I found in my research is their personalities differ yeah. so yeah, okay. dramatically between day and night. You know, they'll oh, yeah, never right. do what they'll never do what they do at night time during the day, and the reason for that is because we can see them. Yeah, they yeah, hate sure. being seen. Well, it's sort of the opposite for humans, you know. We feel a lot safer in the daytime just... Yeah, just because, because we can we see, do. because yeah, we're because comfortable, we we're in see. our zone. Yeah. But, but they know, they're so uniquely aware that we're blind at night time. They're, 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 over, they're right on top of this advantage they've got on us. Yep. So are they uh, territorial all the time or is it, is it, does it just seem to be with certain males in certain areas or... Yeah, yeah. Well, they do operate in in groups. Now, where you find one, generally there's another not too far away, which is right. probably why you don't find they're dead. Because if you know Uncle Herman drops dead of a natural causes over there, uh, you're not just going to brush a couple of leaves over poor old yeah. Uncle Herman and walk away, are you? Yeah, you're going to sure. take his body because you don't want to be picked apart by by predators, and also you don't want him found by humans. Yeah. And we know that the Neanderthals and and the early Homo's they were burying their dead hundreds of thousands of years yep. ago. So what makes things any diff- these things any different? Nothing. Absolutely yeah, nothing. Sure. But yeah, they are territorial. And I think that's, you know, it took me a long time. It took me a long time to, um, to work out why I got hit that night. And uh, so I'll tell you just quickly the story about that. Yeah. It was uh, January 2nd, 2009. And this is at a, a place called Kilkeven, yep. which is yep. west of Gympie. Yep. And it wasn't really a research operation. It was more lighthearted. But uh, it, coming up between midnight and two o'clock in the morning, of course, everyone starts to dare themselves, uh, dare, dare other people to, to go for a walk by themselves up this certain track. And, <laughs> and everyone's going, no, not me, no, not me, of course. You know, me being me, go, yeah, I'll do it. So I got up and I walked away from camp and I thought, I'll go set myself down in this little valley, which is right next to the base camp. And it's like a granite cascade. And as I and we've been going there for like fifteen years prior to this, and as I get down onto this this granite cascade, I get this overwhelming smell of sulphur, and it was like a real pungent, burning sulphur. And now this yeah. is something we have described to us from so many different witnesses from so many different times. Uh, the smell of sulphur, or a lot of people like to say bakelite. Other people like to say burning electrical type smell. And so I radioed back to base and one of the guys there said, you know, careful, you know what that could mean? And you know, I was a bit complacent at the time. I said, yeah, I'd, yeah, yeah. And I thought it might have been just the mould and mildew coming through the cracks of the rocks because it was kind of damp and mouldy there. So I've gone to the top of this cascade and I've sat down. I had a mag light, a bottle of water and my radio and I put them by my side. And I just started to tune into the bush, like really focus and just listen to all, all my surroundings just to see if we you – know, Sometimes when you're creating a bit of noise around the camp, you'll get a visitor and they'll go from tree to tree and you can hear them walking and they're getting closer because they like to get a, a vantage point where they can watch you. Um, so I'm listening and, I'm, and suddenly I hear this crunch up above me to my right hand side and then another crunch and then off this thing goes. So I've stood up and I've turned around and I've looked up and into the darkness, pure pitch darkness. And this thing just starts marching like a soldier, not a care in the world, walking, marching with purpose. And he and he's coming down towards where I am, level with me. And I've radioed to base camp and I said, head count guys, is everyone there? Yeah, we're all here. I said, well, I've got company. And the moment I said, oh, I've got company, this thing turns to its left, and it starts to sprint down the hill. I mean, sprinting, running like a sprinter. And this is in pitch darkness over terrain that we would have rolled down, uh, and it obviously saw very well, and he is running with great speed, and I'm like, he's got to stop. 
he's got to stop. He keeps coming. I'm going, he's got to stop. He oh, so stop. he was coming at you. He's coming at me. Right. And, and, and I'm going, he's got to stop now. He's got to, he's got to, and, and I'm, I'm thinking at any stage he's going to stop by a tree. No, no, he's still coming. No, he's got to, because I wrote the book on these things, right? But he hasn't, yeah, yeah. He, he hasn't read my book. Yeah. And he keeps running and running and running. And now he's leapt onto the, the path in, on top of me. And I knew at this stage, there was no way he could stop even if he wanted to. And yeah. I was just like, just, I was bracing for impact. And now he's, he's coming right at me only 10 metres away and kapow, he hits me fair square right in the chest. And it would have been with either a, a really big hand or it would have been his forearm. And he hits me in the chest with such an impact. I lost my feet. I went through the air yeah. and I landed on my back in water. And now he's standing over the top of me and I'm just ready for him to pick me up and just start s flicking me into a tree, just breaking me apart. Yeah. So I'm kicking up in the air. I'm yelling to base camp and I'm yelling out for help. Uh, and I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm rocking from side to side on my back and I'm kicking in the air every direction I could possibly kick to try and keep this thing off me. And I was hysterical. I was beside myself. I didn't know what his next move was. I was aware he was right above me. And then I see the flashlights come up from, uh, up from base and they're, they're coming up uh, the granite cascade and he sees them coming. So he stepped off me and he's walked around the trees to my right. They get me, they've picked me up and I'm like soaking and dirty and uh, they've, they've cleaned me up and I said, he's gone that way, he's gone that way. So we go after him and he keeps pace with us. When we stop, he stops. When he's looking at us in pitch darkness, his eyes are illuminating yep, yep. a dull white yep. and we're watching him blink at us. Yep. And then when we start to move forward, it's all black because he's turned his head and he's taking the same pace as what we are, all black. But when we stop, he stops and he turns around and looks at us. The eyes are back. Yeah. Blink, blink like this. Now, this is another really interesting thing. These eyes were self-illuminating. They weren't reflections. Right. There was no moonlight. There was no starlight. We were deep in a valley with a forested canopy. There was no reflection. These things were self-illuminating. And we hear this a lot. Right. I tell you what, mate, if that was me, sulfur wouldn't be the only thing you're smelling, eh? Hey? <laughs> 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 Man. Yeah, I definitely want to come out and check it out. So how, what's your success rate sort of for uh, not uh, visual encounters, but just, just encounters? Even uh, hearing them. Yeah, when you go out. Oh, uh, Pretty good, but it, I mean, it's a numbers game. It's like, like anything. It's, yeah, it's just being the right place at the right time. I mean, you can go to a very well-known area where you've had a lot of encounters and you, know, you might have three or four trips where there's been nothing, but then then you might have one of the most action-packed nights you've had in a long time. Sounds like fishing. Yeah, yeah well, there <laughs> you go. time you yeah. go out, catch nothing, and then all of a sudden, yeah. ooh, bragging rights. And, but it, it also comes down to the personality you're dealing with. That's the yeah. big one, you know, because some of them, they'll just stand there and just let you go past. And you know what they do? They... Yeah, we just touching on how blind we are. Yeah. Even during the daytime, we're blind. And what are we looking at when we're walking down uh, bush tracks? We're looking at our feet. Placely. Yeah, usually a couple of steps in yeah. front of your feet. Yeah, we're looking down the track and we're looking where we're putting our feet. We're avoiding the rocks and twisting yep. an ankle. We're very rarely absorbing what's around us. For sure. And so what they do, they will stand next to a tree and they'll put one arm around the tree and one arm out like a branch. Yeah, right. And they'll pretend to be a tree or both arms around a branch and um, and pretend they're a part of a tree. Right. Um, now, I've told a lot of our witnesses this over time, and they said there's the best information they could possibly have had um, because there's, there's an example here. I oh, know this isn't television. Yeah. See that one there? Yeah. That, that's, that one there's caught, caught by night vision. He's got his arms around a tree at night time, right. pretending he's a part of a tree. Yeah. Huh. So... Um, so that's what they'll do. Even during the daytime, they'll pretend they're a part of a tree. So I always say to people, look out for the dark areas, examine very carefully all the dark areas that you see in bushland. Um, because even if they're just standing still, chances are we're going to walk past them. And the other advantage they have is that they're in a human type form. So a lot of people see them at a distance. It's like, yeah, yeah, they just pass it off. So they get yep. a lot away with a lot. But at nighttime when they're doing this, we've got no chance yeah. of seeing them. We, we're probably walking past them all the time. So they're just taking advantage of our yeah. piss poor peripheral vision. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and just, just just lack of attention, basically. Yeah, yeah well, it's not uh, not until I went and, you know, when I used to hunt when I was younger that I learned how to, how to you look down for two steps and then look up for two steps. 
And it's not until you do that you realise how little you actually look up and pay attention when you're, when you're walking, especially, you know, out in the bush. Yeah, it's very interesting. So where do they live and do they travel often? So if they get oh, sighted, yeah. do they move? Listen. Yeah, so a lot of people believe that they're nomadic. Yeah. They're not. Home is always home. Yeah, sure, they'll travel. They might travel huge distances because, geez, these things, they, they can go. They can go like the wind. And yep. I think, you know, for, for something that seems to be extraordinary, like, say, a distance that may be extraordinary for us, to them, you know, it's just, just what they do. So they, they might be able to travel, you know, 10, 20 Ks. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's just a day trip. Yeah. Um, but they, they could be gone for a couple of weeks. And you, and I, I know this is fact because I speak to people that, uh, have them basically in their backyards and say, no, he's, he's, he's gone for a few weeks, he's gone walkabout. Yeah. And then suddenly he's, he's back. Yeah, back right again. on. Do they create like burrows or caves or anything or do they just – Yeah, you'll find generally uh, well, what we'd call beds really. It's like flattened out areas and yep. where you'll find this will either be in extremely long grass, lantana, something that they've got some sort of covering some, from you know, passers-by. So right. They can watch and not be seen. Is that similar to gorillas? Do they do they nest? Very sort of like similar. That? Yeah. Very yeah. similar. Yeah. Yeah, I thought so. Uh, what was? Yeah. Well, if they're a communal sort of, uh, if they're communal, then it makes sense. For, you know, for them not to be completely nomadic. It's isn't. I think that's how we worked at humans in the early days. Once we became uh, communal and sort of work together to, to farm the land. That's what we, you know, just stayed put and then went from there. Yeah. Well, what I try, what I forgot to uh, t- touch on when I, when I was hit and this, this smell of sulfur was that the very next morning after this event where I was hit, I went for a walk by myself stupidly. I had nothing with me. I had no, no phone because there was no phone reception. So I didn't take it with me, ignoring the fact that there was a camera in my phone. Yeah. Uh, I had no water. I was deeply dehydrated and it's only one track back to camp and I've been gone for about an hour and a half or so and as I'm coming down the hill I see on my right on my left hand side in the long grass on the side of the track here's one sitting there and and she I don't know why I say she I always say she because I just get that this feeling it was a her and she's sitting there in the long grass up to about waist height and I've gone oh crap is this the one that hit me last night yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. But what I did know was I have to get past this because I needed water pronto. Yeah. And uh, so it was basically baby steps, baby steps. And as I'm coming down the hill, she's obviously seen me and she's leant forward into the grass and now I can't see her anymore. But I know she's there. And it's going, oh, this makes things worse. Uh, so baby steps, baby steps. And I'm coming down closer, coming down closer. And as I get right level with her, I still can't see her. I'm sort of glancing over to my left and then whack, whack, whack on my right hand side, right next to me. Here's another one. Now, this is the big male. This is the guy that hit me last oh, night. Right. Now, I got too close to her. So he's doing the big warning sign with with with, with the and this I don't know I imagine it would have been like a pretty thick stick yeah uh, that he's belted belted three times on the side of this um, this side of this tree and it was the only area there because this is all pine forest there's only a- area there that was really just like thick with foliage I guess because I couldn't see him but he was only meters away from me. He was only probably about four or five meters away from me. So I've got her on this side. I've got him on this side and he's doing the, the big, the big show. And, uh, and, I was just, <laughs> and so I've, I've basically just taken baby steps, baby steps, baby steps, don't look back, baby steps, baby steps, a bit, bit quicker. And as soon as I got down the track, oh boy, did I go. They're trying um, to look as non-threatening as possible. I know. So, so basically it took me a while to work it out, but what I think it happened that night when I'd gone down on to that granite cascade, that sulfuric smell, I think that was her. Right. And I think I was too close. Too close. Yeah, okay, right. It's in, I feel like it must feel pretty similar, not that I ever have, but coming sort of face to face with a family of uh, gorillas, you know, you know that just, there is no defence. If they want to attack and they decide to, you just, as a human, you just can't do anything about it. Your life is in their hands. Yeah. Depending on how they're feeling that day. That'd be terrifying. I'd never go outdoors again. It is. It is, <laughs> it is one of the most terrifying experiences. And, you know, I always say to myself, I'll never put myself in this position again. Yep. But what do I do? <laughs> yeah, well, that's human nature, isn't it? 
What is um, the difference between males and females? Are they bigger or? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they're both pretty big, but yeah, I mean, you can get a fully grown one at about. I don't know, six foot, I guess, but you can also get them up to about nine foot, and that's just incomprehensible. Yeah, I mean, yeah. If, if that head height is nine feet and they've got longer arms disproportionate to a human, imagine what the reach is. Yeah, yeah, for that's sure, that's huge. But yeah, I think generally, um, the, the females are a little bit smaller, but you don't see the females very often, right? Very on. rarely people are, are reporting breasts. Yeah, yeah, you know, we'll get the obvious, uh, the odd, um, genitalia report from a, about a male here yeah. and there, but but generally, you know, we, well, because it's, it's, they're so hairy down there you, that people, well, they're not really looking at that in the first place because they're still trying to comprehend <laughs> yeah. what they're seeing. Um, <laughs> and and uh, this is uh, that, uh, that, that truck driver at Witherin, you know, he said, I had a camera on me on my phone. He said, but he said, uh, again, you know, this, this term life preservation, he said, the last thing you're thinking about is yeah, where's sure. my camera? Yep. Uh, what was I going to ask you about juveniles, babies? Um, has have there ever been other than uh, the one sort of clacker? And you said that was a, a young one, assumed to be a young one. Are there have there any be have there ever been any sightings of act like really really young ones? And what yeah. how big would they be? Yeah, yeah, that they have. I mean, they've been seen in family units. I mean, it's rare. Right. It's yeah, rare, yeah. but yeah. but they have been seen in family units and or and or with just an adult. Uh, I know when I was at one of my locations at Springbrook, yeah, uh, it would have been about twenty years ago. Uh, we were parked there, and there's a house right down the end of this road, and it's uh, it's deep into the bush. And this guy pulled over and inquired as to what we were doing. We said who we are, were, and immediately he knew he knew us. And he said, "Oh well, see, I've, I've got a story for you." He said, "About three years ago, uh, it was at night time." He said, "I I heard a lot of commotion come from my, my chook shed." And he said, "Myself, and my wife, we walked out the back, and he said, here is this little monkey sitting on top of the chicken coop.' Right. And he said, this thing looks at us." And he, <coughs> and he turns around and he leaps onto the side of a tree, drops to the ground and runs off through the bush. So this is probably a juvenile. Yep, yep. And they're the sort of reports we have of the young ones. So sort of mistaken identity for um, for monkeys, you know. Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. Bloody hell. Well, well let's um, – did you – were you going to ask oh, I've got so many yeah. questions. I've got a whole <laughs> yeah, go sheet for it. here of okay. questions. Um, how many are there? I mean, how hard are they to find? Like, could you go into any local, I mean, if we went to Mount Tambourine right now and there hadn't been any sightings, do you think that they would still be there? Like, Yeah, yeah, they'll definitely still be there. Um, maybe gone for a wander. I know during the bushfires, I think they went on holidays south yeah. somewhere. Sorry, guys. But um, yeah, no, that they are always there just because you don't see them. Uh, doesn't mean they're not there, obviously. I mean, you, you'll be walking – people walk past them all the time, just don't see them. It's, I mean, look, we don't want to be seen. We won't be seen. If we were a yeah, escaped convict, we wouldn't be seen if we were out there. We just duck behind the bush and someone walks past and they know no different and off they go. So do you think when people are out there uh, looking for them that – uh, any in the area might get a bit curious and think, oh, there's some humans over there. I might go and have a bit of a gander. Yeah, happens all the time. Yeah, right. Eh? So, yeah, one of our practices that we, we employ is to cause some commotion at night yep, time. Yep. Yeah, Cor- okay. yeah. I mean, yeah, you can, you, there's, there's two ways of going about it. You can be totally stealth, uh, you can sit there and, uh, make sure there's no noise, no light, and yep. you just sit there and wait. It's pretty boring, but, geez, it's not when one comes along, though, and he, yeah. does, and he doesn't know that you're there. Yep. Um, the opposite side of the coin is you have the laughter, you have the music, you yeah. cause an attraction for them to come over and have a look. Chances are they will uh, – they'll, they'll, they'll do that. I think it – if you know, wouldn't you? You'd rather them know you're there, wouldn't you? <laughs> we, you'd hate for one to be startled by you. The problem is that you don't know if they're there or not. It's particularly yeah. if you're making a lot of noise and they're being stealth, trying to get that good vantage point behind that that tree. Yeah, true. So you need something that you'll be able to see them with. And I find the best toy in my inventory is Fleur. Oh, yeah, right. Nothing escapes the FLIR. Yep. Night vision's very good, but you've got to buy a good night vision. Um, but FLIR is excellent. For sure, yeah. Have you ever used uh, people as like a, a – a bait's probably a bad word. But yeah, like a, you yeah know, it, it's normally me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, kick back and try yeah, and catch yeah. something from the outside. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah, we've got a good case of this uh, by the SAS in Ormo, actually. They, they set up that lone camper situation. 
Right. Yeah. And right. that was that was for the bad one. I, I got the SAS involved because he was making too much of a, a danger of himself there at one stage. Oh yeah. Have you ever had any sightings out here in the cane fields? Yeah. Yeah. Oh right. Yeah, there, there has been a lot of talk. Uh, in fact, one was seen crossing the highway uh, and it was seen by several motorists and he went straight into the cane on the other side of the M1 and there's been a, a few out towards Jacob's Well that have been uh, cane- going yowie hunting. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, cane fields are creepy enough at the best of times. Now this. I don't oh, know. It's creepy here at night, hey, especially when it you're is. the last person here and you lock it up and ugh. Yep. So this, this one at Ormo, he was bad. He's probably the baddest that I knew about and he... I don't know what his issue was. I know that he didn't like humans, that's for sure. Uh, whether it's because we were encroaching on his land during that time, because as you know, you know there's all there's all new real estate out that way. Norfolk was, was sort of semi-recent. Yeah. And he just, well, I don't think it was just me that he didn't like it. He just didn't like humans in general. And about... It would have been about a month after I was nearly taken by this one. We had a show called Missing Persons back in the day, and a guy went missing on Sandy Creek Road in Yatla. Right. And that was back when Sandy Creek Road was a Sandy Creek Road, not a yeah. paved bitumen road. And what, what had happened was – and this was just not far away from where I was, and it happened right on dusk. And the story was that his work colleagues had dropped him off on the side of this – Sandy Creek Road, and he had an esky and a couple of other peripherals, and he was waiting for friends to come and pick him up. When his friends arrived, there was nothing there but an esky, and the guy was never found again. And I thought, ooh, ooh, yeah. ooh, was it this one that he's, he's bumped into? Um, he was the one that was seen crossing the road into the cane fields as well. And, uh, and it was funny, one of the women, she was, she was on her way to work in the morning and, she's, and there was a big traffic jam and, and uh, she sees what she thought was a homeless person trundling, that's her expression, trundling down the side of the road, looking disorientated. Yeah. And, uh, and then suddenly this smell came through her car and she's gradually getting up closer and closer and she looks up through the windscreen and this thing turns around and looks down at her. She says, ah! she said it was the most horrifying face she's ever seen in her life. And she said that moment he just turns and he runs right out on the highway in front of all these cars in between them all and goes off into the cane fields on on the other side and um so anyway i've gone back to this location it would have been december of uh 2007 and i'm out there with a pair of binoculars and this this little old camera and there's this kid would have been the age of Oh, I'm guessing probably about 13 years old. He comes up to me and really impertinent. This is really strange because, hey, mister, what are you doing? And I thought, what a strange thing to ask. I said, I'm, I'm, uh, and I looked out at my binoculars. I said, I'm bird watching. And he <laughs> says, uh, no, you're not. And I'm going, rack off, kid. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, I said, what do you think I'm doing? He goes, you're looking for that thing, aren't you? And then suddenly my antennas went up. Yeah. Oh, really? What thing are you, uh, what are you referring to? You're from the government, aren't you? <laughs> and I go, wow, this guy's really reaching. And what, 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 what is this, this thing? He goes, that big thing, that big hairy thing. Yeah, and right. And I've gone, wow, how about that for vindication? Yeah. So what had happened was, and I'd already been out there, I'd already seen this. He, they, him and his friends, he had three friends, and they were building this bush hut. And there was almost to completion. They had all this stuff out there in their backpacks and stuff. And suddenly this crashing starts coming through the bush. This is the, the bush between Norfolk and, and Ormo. Yeah. And this crashing starts coming through the bush. Everything's been broke down. And then suddenly they get sight of it. And here's this big seven-foot hairy Neanderthal-looking thing just tearing straight at them. They drop all their gear and they run off. And this thing chases them. And they just got out of the clearing in time. Now, this thing's turned back around. It's walked back to their hut and destroyed it. He said they were standing there listening to everything. Every plank being removed and then thrown through the bush. Making a statement. Making a <clears throat> statement. And so while I was out there, and, and this is prior to this this kid coming up, I saw this and it was a mess. I mean, the whole thing was just broken up. It was smashed everywhere. Yep. And I found chicken eggs with the top of it, like a, a finger had gone through the top and the contents were all sucked out. Yep. So he's obviously got chicken eggs from somewhere and eaten them raw, but they're, be- they're D-sized batteries in these kids' bags and they were bitten in half. <laughs> and a little, uh, bit, a little bit of spice with your eggs. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody hell. See, yeah, if that was me, I was one of them kids. I'd ankle tap one of me mates and, you know, better you than me, mate. 
So what should you do if you're out and you have an encounter with one? You said about not looking them in the eyes. Yeah. Well, isn't it? That's known across the animal kingdom, isn't it? Like humans are the only, uh, one of the only animals that uh, we can look into each other's eyes oh, without it? it being a, well, it a, a form of communication. It's a communication. That's mm. what it is. When you engage somebody with eye contact, yep, yep. It, it is communication. So you, you don't you don't want that. Um, oh, if it's at night time, you know, what you suggest is hopefully you've got a really bright torch and you can hurt their eyes. Because remember how sensitive their eyes yep, are at night yep. time compared to ours? Well, you know, I think a big strong light would uh, be a deterrent to some extent. And plus, they don't like being seen. They freak out if they're seen. Yep. Um, so I'd, I'd suggest that. And if you don't have that, then um, just, just gradually just get out of there as quick as you can. Yep. Try, try not look behind and you know, they will chase you. They will. And they will tail you. They'll <laughs> flank you at 45 degrees. I had one out at, um, at um, Daisy Hill uh, and he flanked me 45 degrees yep. until he thought, it's go time, and then he he rushed me, and uh, I only just got out of there. He wasn't a big one though; he was a smaller one out there. And we've had a few reports out there at Daisy Hill. Bloody hell! So we're people for people that have, uh, you know, for any of our listeners that have had their own encounters. Uh, where can we direct them? You know, what what is your best? point of contact for for those people you know to talk to you guys yeah well there's a submission section in our website so if you go to uh, the australian yowie research website or yowie hunters website just type in yowiehunters.com you'll see there in the menu bar you've got uh, submit a report or alternatively uh, contact us yeah cool excellent what else have you got there rachel oh heaps <laughs> here all day no i went <laughs> um <coughs> Have they found any bones or anything like that? Good question. I didn't even think of that. Good question. Yeah. Well, <laughs> we, you know, we, we're in contact with uh, bodies such as Parks and Wildlife, yep. the police on all levels and the military on all levels. They come to us and sometimes we'll do a sharing arrangement with, right. the, with information. Okay. Um, we also have people that come to us with information with, uh, there's been a body found, bones found, etc. Um, the thing that people do, the first port of call and the, the most natural reaction for anybody is what do you do? You phone the police. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So there's, there's been situations where a body has been found or yeah. bodies have been found and bones have been found. Yeah. They've phoned the police. Now, the police in turn have uh, phoned uh, a body at the Campbell Street, uh, Campbell Street uh, Fed building in Sydney. Right. And they've come out in each of these uh, occasions, cordoned off the area, not involved the witness at all in any of this, yep. removed everything. When the witness has gone back to the local police station, asked what's gone on, with the, what, 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 what was the outcome, yep. uh, they've received no information. Basically, everything's just been swept under the cover. Right. Well, what else you got there? Um, what was I going to say? Day in your life. So obviously you're flat out responding to sightings and inquiries, but how often do you actually get to go out and look for them? Yeah, there's, there's not enough hours in the day. You know, I sort of start at six and I don't finish until about eight o'clock at night time. Yeah, yeah. And just, just documenting and, and so forth. And, and you know, so many people just need, need to reach out to you and, and talk to you about what they've seen. Um, so, you know, that... I guess you say hinders the time I have to go out in the field, but I, I, the field work that I did uh, for so many years was extensive. Um, so I've already have my experience going out. I have my experiences with them. Um, now I'm probably limited to know, once a week, once a fortnight. Yep. I'll yep. Go out these days. Yep. Jeez, that's plenty. I reckon <laughs> with the amount of harsh encounters you've had, I reckon I'd uh, I'd call it a day and and take more of a managerial role. That's it. Uh, one question from one of our listeners was: Is there anywhere in Australia that you get uh, the most Yowie sightings? Any states oh, in particular? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good question. I'd say number one area for sightings would have to be the Blue Mountains. Number, right. number two would be probably the Sunshine Coast. Or Gold Coast hinterland. Yeah, yep. yeah. Well, it's good, good uh, terrain through there. eh? beautiful. Yeah, but basically all the way along Great Dividing Range. Victoria is another place that's really coming uh, up to speed with with sightings, particularly around the um, Bendigo, Hepburn Springs area. Uh, 
they're, they're getting a lot of reports around there. Yeah. Um, I think Ormo was probably the most prominent, and I haven't finished with Ormo yet. I've got I've got a lot more stories about Ormo. Yeah, right. We'll be here all day. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, might, I might have to come back for part two. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> yeah, well, so – Oh, no, no. I could go into bloody Ormo because it's – if you don't know uh, any listeners, the Ormo is where we are, you know, we're, we're, this is where head office is. So Been here for well over a decade. Yeah, and it's usually me and Rachel that are sort of here, you know, we're the last ones and walking out in the car park. It's oh, always it's a little spooky. bit eerie, yeah. Because it's not just cane fields, there is like forestry around yeah, here. Yeah, straight across the road it's all thick bush. Mm. Yeah, well. And they do pop up in the most unusual – Places, places you just wouldn't expect. Yeah. Well, that's great. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> um, all right. Well, we will, we're will. we going to have to do a part two, I reckon, because yeah. uh, I want to hear more about the Ormo stories. Yeah, there's a lot more to cover. I mean, I, I have a, a lot of information Excellent. that I think would, uh, you'd, you'd enjoy. Yep. Cool. Well, if any any of you guys get in, get in contact with them at, at yeahwehunters.com, let us know too so we can uh, – you know, track it and keep an, uh, keep an eye on it all, yeah. Cause yeah, we'll have to share interesting. some photos and videos and stuff on our social media. For sure, absolutely. All right. All right. <sighs> Time flies, eh? An hour and a quarter already. That's crazy. All right. Anything you want to add? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Before we wrap um, up for part one. Yeah, any, any – I don't uh, hold you too long. Anything else to tell the, the listeners, I suppose, uh, before we wrap this one up? No, I'd just uh, like to re- reiterate the fact that there has been a fear of ridicule in the past that is diminishing, uh, diminishing quite rapidly, actually. People are uh, very keen to come forward. So if you or anyone you know has had an encounter and needs someone to talk to, by all means, please contact us. Excellent. I was actually quite surprised when we put up that story yesterday asking people for questions. I expected a lot more funny questions. Same. Yeah, I did too. There's, yeah, especially the, with our community that love the banter and, you know. Yeah, and they were legit. They were all very serious. It was, yeah, it was great. I yeah. thought so too. All right, Dean. Well, thanks for your time, mate. And, yeah, I'm excited. I want to come out and have a, have a uh, you know, blow fly an actual, um, uh, what do you call it, a what do you call it when you go out? Oh. Expedition. Okay, excellent. I was going to call yeah, it a hunt, expedition. but <laughs> it's not really a hunt, is it, when you're the prey? <laughs> Life has been so boring till now. now yeah, I know. Yeah, we're exploring. Oh, well, yes. <laughs> yeah, thanks for your time, mate. And uh, we'll, we'll look definitely forward to, have to... We'll look forward to part two. Me too. Me too. I hope you enjoyed our chat. Thanks to Rachel and Brad for the opportunity. There was lots of stories and information to unpack. It was only weeks after this interview when we shot the thermal yaoi footage at Springbrook, a story I'll tell them about on the next visit. Thanks for listening.